Hi, thank you all for joining us today for SNF Agora Conversations, the politics and policy of COVID-19. I'm Hari Han, a professor of political science and director of the SNF Agora Institute here at Johns Hopkins University. The SNF Agora Institute, for those of you who don't know, is an academic and public forum dedicated to improving and expanding civic engagement and informed inclusive dialogue as the cornerstone of global democracy. SNF Agora Conversations is a new weekly series in which we're taking a social scientific evidence-based approach to exploring some of the most vexing political and policy issues surrounding the pandemic. Today, we're talking about imagining a new moral economy. And joining me are three terrific guests. Um, we have Angus Bergen, who is an associate professor of history here at Johns Hopkins University. Margaret Levy, who is the director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, and also a member of the Academic Advisory Board of the SNF Agora Institute. And I should also mention that Margaret is a native Baltimorean, so we're especially delighted, Margaret, to virtually welcome you back to your hometown. And finally, we have Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is currently the CEO of New America, a professor emerita of politics and international affairs at Princeton University, and former director of policy planning for the US Department of State. Thank you all for being here with us today. So today, the four of us are gonna spend about 30 minutes talking about the possibilities for imagining a new moral economy. Crisis and opportunity are two sides of the same coin, and with every crisis comes the opportunity to reimagine a different world even as we grapple with and support each other through the crisis that we're all facing right now in our communities. Our panelists will offer both a historical and a future-oriented look at this question, and then we'll open it up for your questions. So thank you all to those of you who've already submitted so many great questions to us. As a reminder for the audience, um, anytime throughout this conversation, you can submit your question through the dialog box, which should be just to the right of your video or just below it, depending on the device that you're using. So Anne-Marie, Margaret, Angus, um, I have to admit that I've personally been really excited all week for this discussion. I know that I'm learning, going to learn a lot and I'm really looking forward to the conversation with you all. So what I thought we could do is divide our opening discussion into three parts. Um, first, let's just have a conversation about why is it that we need to imagine something anew? Um, what's wrong with what we have now? Um, second, what is the vision to which we should be reaching? And third, what are the choices that we need to make now to get there? So Margaret, maybe I'll start with you um, because I know that long before any of us had even been thinking about pandemics or COVID-19, you've been leading a project at Stanford on imagining a new moral political economy, um, which is one of several that are actually going on around the world. And so can you talk to us about what was it that you were seeing before the pandemic really hit our global community that made it clear that we need to rebuild the structure of our political economy? So we were hardly alone, as you've mentioned. I mean, New America, Angus and his work have been recognizing the same kind of phenomenon, which is that the kinds of institutions and arrangements that we built for our government, for our economy, for our markets, um, that were built in the post-World War II era, and most of them dating back in the US to the Great Depression, uh, really are no longer adequate for the kind of political uh, situation or economic or economy that we're currently in. They were built for an industrial economy. We're now in much more of a service economy. And part of what is driving, so we saw the, we saw the political economic framework as fraying. And again, we're hardly alone in doing that. But we also recognize that since the days of Adam Smith, there has been a succession of political economic frameworks and strategies um, one succeeding another. So Keynesianism was succeeded by supply side economics, neoliberalism, and that we had an obligation to do the kinds of thinking in it and providing the intellectual bulwark for a new way of imagining a political economic framework. So that's really what our project is about. We fundamentally, we see the political economy as a political choice that a society makes and that it's time to make a new set of choices, even apart from COVID-19. That's great. You know, there's the old saying that says, um, you know, who invented water? Well, I don't know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a fish. And so sometimes we don't really understand that these structures that we all move in are actually choices that we can make. And we have the opportunity now right. to imagine something different. 
they're not natural. They're something we construct as humans. Excellent. Absolutely. Um, so Anne Marie, I want to turn to you. Um, I know that you wrote a recent uh, terrific op-ed in the New York Times that everyone should read if you haven't read it already. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how this current pandemic has amplified or highlighted the kinds of things that Margaret is discussing and that you talked about in your op-ed? Absolutely. Well, maybe I can start uh, with that la Margaret's last point and your point about the, the we, because so often we think of the world we're in, the economy we're in uh, as something that someone else created, uh, but actually it's choices we made as a society back in the New Deal, back in the 1980s. And the question today is who's the we? And the we of America is changing dramatically. Right? The country uh, is on its way to being a plurality country with no one majority, a wonderfully diverse uh, country. Uh, but most of the folks who are the America today were never consulted about the kind of economy and society uh, we need to have. And right this minute, the COVID crisis is taking the existing divisions, which I would call fissures in many ways, the inequalities, uh, the, the things, just something as simple as who has broadband and who doesn't, and cracking it wide open. Suddenly you see you know, people who can get educated at home, people who can work on a screen like this, and others who have no job and jobs and their child have, children have no broadband. Uh, so it's cracked open what were big, big, uh, already existing divides in our society. But that gives us a moment of opportunity to reshape who we want to be, and in Margaret's language, to make new choices. And part of the importance of, of the idea of a moral political economy is that these are moral choices. Who gets included? Who doesn't? So I think I'll stop there, and, and we can talk about the specific choices. Yeah, that's great. Um, and Angus, I want to bring you into the conversation in just a second, but maybe uh, Margaret and Anne Marie, I can follow up with one question, which is that for our audience who've never really thought about questions about political economy before, or may not really have thought about, can you just give us an example of how is the sort of lived experience, the kinds of things that you're describing, Anne Marie, connected to some of the choices that we've made in terms of the broad political economic framework that we're using? I don't know if there's an example that comes to mind for either one of you that helps illustrate. Yeah, the one that comes to mind for me is wealth, the welfare system. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we have multiple variants of welfare systems around the world. The United States made a certain choice right. based on, and then reformed it, made on certain premises that were informed by the prevailing economic ideology and political ideology of the time. And those are choices that can be made and remade as time goes on, how we're gonna actually provide those who are in need in our society or provide basic support to those as they go through different transitions in their lives. Yeah, that's great. Hi, Marie? A very concrete one, which is how we value care and the work of care. And that means teaching, uh, obviously it means medical care, it means coaching, it means all the ways we invest in other people. I, I laugh that after day one of homeschooling, you had men write, tweeting things like, geez, teachers should be paid a million dollars a year because suddenly they realize how hard it is. And yet we as a society do not value teachers. Uh, if we did, we don't pay them enough, but we also don't value them particularly socially. I mean, to say I'm a teacher is not the same as saying I'm a doctor or a lawyer or something else. And those are choices we can make to look around and say, hey, actually these people who take care of other people in our society, who invest in other people, are people we should really value. Mm -hmm. And globally, as you all both point out, we've seen different choices made in different places. Um, so Angus, maybe this is a great way to bring you into the conversation because you know, you've written in some ways like a, you know, a really important book about sort of thinking about these questions of political economy in a historical sense. And so can you, historically speaking, give us a sense of what are the conditions under which economic crises or other kind of societal crises like the ones that we're in right now lead to a reimagining of a different kind of socioeconomic structure? Yeah, well, I mean, one point I'd, I'd like to emphasize is that yeah, I, it's a bit of a misnomer to think that crises lead to a reimagining. Re a, a lot of the work to do the reimagining needs to happen before a crisis takes place, right? And so if you look at 
any of these moments, whether the 1930s, the 1970s, where we can think of sort of epochal shifts in the way that people address issues of political economy, a lot of the underlying work uh, for that transformation happened within theoretical communities, often decades before a crisis came to pass where they, they came to light and, and, and were enacted into policy. And so, you know, I take that as one of the, the central missions of the work that Margaret has been doing and the work that Anne-Marie is doing is, is trying to take the ideas that are out there, bring them together, get people speaking to each other, and then make them accessible to policymakers so that uh, when a crisis like, like the one we're in right now uh, emerges, uh, it becomes newly possible for people not to have to reinvent the wheel, but rather just reach for ideas that are available on the shelf uh, to experiment with possible solutions. Great. And do you have an example of one that, that you saw historically that you've written about um, where there was an idea that was on the shelf that got fed into the kind of changes that were made? Yeah, well, you know, so I've, I've written a fair amount about Milton Friedman, who's a great example of this. You know, I mean, one, one thing I think we can we can take heart in our present moment, it sometimes feels like things really uh, are, it's, it's impossible to change our present circumstances, right? Our politics are so intractable. And that it's interesting to look at the period after the 1930s and 1940s when somebody like Friedman felt like his ideas were completely marginalized. Uh, free markets were uh, on the retreat or, uh, you know, to, to Friedman's uh, view around the world. And, uh, and, and then uh, set about trying to develop both a range of policy ideas and the kind of new moral imagination that would be immediately available. And so the list is extraordinarily long for somebody like him, whether it's flexible exchange rates in the wake of Bretton Woods, whether it's monetarism in the wake of the, uh, the crisis with stagflation, yeah. whether, uh, to Margaret's point earlier, whether it's uh, welfare to work, right? Friedman was uh, had the idea of the negative income tax, which became enormously influential in the reinvention of welfare systems in an American context and elsewhere after uh, there was a sense that they had been breaking down. So, I mean, it's uh, there. The, the examples are really countless of how uh, policy ideas that are floating out there seen as marginalized and strange and unpracticable suddenly in a moment of crisis seem newly realistic. Yeah, that's great. Um, so maybe we can dive into some of those ideas now and, um, and you know, here in the second part of our discussion. So Margaret, um, I've heard you say this line, which I really love, which is this idea that as long as there are things that need to be done, there will be work, right? And the challenge that we have is not to create work because God knows, I don't feel like I need any more of that, right? But we need to make the work dignified. And so can you, what does that mean? When you say that, what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, I should give credit where credit is due. And I, I'm quoting Tim O'Reilly when I say that. There's a friend of several of us. Um, so dignified work, I mean, some of it's already been touched on when Anne-Marie was talking about caring work and we can come back to that. But it really involves respect and recognition. So one of the things that COVID-19 has been doing is revealing to us all kinds of workers who have largely been invisible and who we haven't valued their work. And I'm not just talking about health workers and first responders. It's the people who clean the hospitals. It's the people who, who are putting things on the grocery shelves. It's the delivery people, the gig workers of a whole variety of kinds. So how do we concretely give that work dignity? And I think a lot of it is really very concrete. It's, it's showing our respect and recognition through decent pay, through mm -hmm. decent working conditions, through benefits and social insurance schemes that really work for them. And by finding new forms of ways in which workers can, of all kinds, can have voice. And then finding ways for us to really show them um, our gratitude. But I think a large group of workers that need this kind of recognition is exactly who Anne Marie was talking about, the care workers. So I will pass it, I will pass the ball back to her. <laughs> well, so Anne Marie, maybe I'll um, you know, so you've written about so many aspects of this problem um, from you know the perspective of your role as a policymaker to a scholar of political economy, but also as a woman and a mom grappling um, with some of the dilemmas that you face in your own professional life um, and the lack of value that people put on the care economy. So can you uh, maybe take us through more about what's the vision that you see as we grapple with um, the changes that this pandemic will bring? Well, the, the, perhaps the easiest one to see is uh, paid sick leave, right? Mm -hmm. The United States is 
absolutely at the bottom of our peer countries when it comes to ha having no mandated paid sick leave. So it's up to the employer. Uh, and that means somebody who actually, you know, could have the virus today uh, could be required to go into work or lose their job. Uh, and so you're, you're seeing immediately when Congress acts, it puts paid man mandatory paid sick leave in uh, for many workers, still not for all of them. Uh, but suddenly people are realizing, wait a minute, if that worker is sick, I could be sick. So suddenly we are connected uh, in a way that makes their interests our interests. And one of the things I fully expect to come out of this is not just paid sick leave, but uh, let's think bigger. Let's make bigger choices. So the uh, uh, iGen Who and her organization, Caring Across Generations, has a proposal for a family security account that would be like a social security account that all Americans would have access to be able to uh, take days off, uh, the time off they need to care for children, for elders, for themselves, uh, for sick family members. So there's just one example of how most other countries have paid parental leave. We don't even have paid maternity leave and paid sick leave. That's something that would actually make all of us stronger and healthier uh, and better, but we have not been able to marshal the political will to do. So I want to follow up a little bit on that, and maybe this is a question for all three of you, because I've heard um, all of you talk about this, that but part of what you're proposing, as I understand it, is in imagining a new moral political economy is not just the change in policy, which of course we need in the ways that um, Anne-Marie, you, you and others have described, but also that we need a fundamental rethinking of what the assumptions and structures are that underlie the economy. And could you maybe try to, I don't know if one of you feels comfortable maybe trying to tease out, like what are some of those assumptions that we wanna to try to change? And what does that imply for the structures that also need to uh, change well, alongside that? One of them is the way we think about markets. Uh, we, we've made an assumption, certainly in this country and many other countries since the 1980s, that um, free markets are the way to go and that all markets are the same. My colleague, Deborah Satz, has written a wonderful book about noxious markets, markets that actually do very problematic things. So we can't give primacy to markets the way we have they need to be rethought. Markets are a very good thing in some circumstances. And without certain kinds of regulations or limits, markets are a set of rules of the game. And they can be regulated and affected and influenced by law and by our desire to contain certain problematic aspects of law of markets while enriching and enabling certain uh, positive aspects of markets. And I'm talking about labor markets. I'm talking about supply chain markets. I'm talking about a whole variety of markets out there. So, you know, that's an assumption we have to get rid of that all markets are equal and all mark all freedom in markets is good. Yeah, I'll add that. Uh, I'll ahead. add one other, which is the, the question of who who does a corporation serve. Mm. Right? Um, I think uh, it's sometimes we take for granted today the idea that a corporation is designed to serve its shareholders, and we forget how new that idea is, uh, and that. If you go deeper in the history of the corporation, there is an idea that there are multiple stakeholders between customers, uh, employees, the communities they inhabit, and so on. And you know, in an in environment in which we see corporations that have engaged in uh, massive share buybacks in recent years suddenly laying off or furloughing large numbers of employees, it raises once again the question of whether we need to think about these central institutions in our contemporary environment differently. Right. So actually, Angus, I will, um, we actually had a question on this topic and I wanna make sure we get to the third part of our discussion before we turn to audience Q&A, but maybe I'll just pose it to you because it follows directly on what you just said, where Tony um, asked, um, you know, that company, companies were originally granted incorporation charters if they were for the public benefit. And how has that changed historically? I don't know if you could speak to that. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, in the, in the in especially the er earlier years of the 19th century, I mean, it was, it was, could be difficult to obtain a corporate charter, right? And the idea is that you have to demonstrate uh, the service that you're performing uh, for a broader public in order to gain that privilege. And we, we go from there all the way to more recent years where, you know, uh, there are arguments that cor corporations are, are people, right? And, and should be accorded the rights of people. It's a very different conceptualization of the, of the corporation. And, um, so, you know, I, I, I think that we have to be conscious of that. I mean, Keynes himself once said that history is a sort of precursor to emancipation. 
right? Um, yeah, you need history in order to emancipate your mind. Otherwise, you're locked into the way that you think about things in the present. And so these ideas that we take for granted about corporations, whether the, the, the rights of corporations or, uh, or whether who they're accountable to uh, are not timeless. They are in many ways new. Uh, they, are, they are developed by scholars um, and propagated through institutions. And we have an opportunity now to engage in, in a new process of rethinking. Yeah. And there is some serious rethinking going on on that. So uh, not just the business roundtable statement, which predated um, COVID-19, but really talking about rethinking that idea of shareholder primacy in corporations. But again, I wanna call out another partner in the moral political economy work, which is the British Academy Future of the Corporation Project, which is doing some remarkable thinking about how to generate um, today's vision of what a corporation should be and yeah. how it serves both is, has purposive goals that are beyond just um, making money for the shareholders. Yeah, and Marie, I know you're trying to get in. I'd love to um, hear you. Have you? Have Sorry. you but no, I'm fascinated. And, and so we're you. We're talking about reimagining markets or thinking about markets, changing our assumptions about markets, uh, changing our assumptions about corporations. I think we need to change our assumptions about man himself. Uh, and I use that advisedly. When you think about uh, who our economy is set up for, it is a man who goes to work for eight plus hours a day and has someone else at home uh, who does all the care work. So that's one thing, obviously we need to, we now need to think, no, we're talking about working people, men and women, by far the majority of American families have two earners uh, or, or, or one earner who is a woman who also has children. So we, we can change our notion of who we're serving and who the, who the basic American is <laughs> in this context, but we can go even, even deeper and say, you know, human beings do advance their self-interest. We want things in the world uh, and we want to advance the, we want to calculate what those interests are. That's the way economists think. But we are also people who want to belong, who want to connect, who want to care. That's part of human nature. If you talk to evolutionary biologists or psychologists, they'll say this idea of these, you know, essentially thinking machines who calculate their interests that's just not, that's part of who we are, but it's not all of who we are. So we need to really change how we think about the human beings we are serving. Right. So the very core of the assumption about whether or not we're rational, self-interested beings, <laughs> or if we're actually social, relational beings who have relationships and people in our lives that we care about can fundamentally change the kind of structures that we create. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I want to, um, you know, I was recently reading a book about, um, I want to bring us kind of into the third part of our discussion. And um, I want to start that by reading a quote um, from a book that I was reading about economic cover recovery after the Great Depression. The author Nick Lamont um, wrote, you know, when ideas have influence, it's rarely because of their singular force. Instead, there has to be a confluence between the ideas themselves, the spirit of the times, and the interests of powerful players who find the ideas congenial. And Angus, this really goes to what you were saying before that it's not that a crisis you know, creates these ideas, but that really they, you know, there have been people like you all that have been doing this work to create them. But can you, can I maybe bring you back to that to sort of talk about um, how did those things like the ideas and the spirit of the times and political power come together after the Great Depression or other crises that we might learn from um, as we respond to this particular moment? Yeah, well, I mean, something I'd, I'd really like to emphasize and that's, that's crucial for all of us to be thinking about is uh, that it's not simply, I think sometimes people have the idea that you generate new policy ideas and then they come into practice. Right? But, um, but the reality is if you wanna engage in a broader act of social transformation, you need to connect those policy ideas to a more capacious moral imaginary, right? You need to, you need to be saying that this is part of a worldview that especially in a democratic society that people find broadly compelling. It doesn't seem like just a hodgepodge of, of uh, policy proposals. And so, you know, that was certainly the case in the New Deal era. Um, you know, the book that, that you were quoting from Nick Lamont, he talks about Adolf Burley and some of the ideas, these, you know, these institutionalist ideas that were deep rooted in a sort of moral vision of the kinds of security that were necessary in a newly complicated world uh, that underlay the transform social transformations in the New Deal. And again, it's true in the 70s and 80s, the Reagan era, 
a moral vision of uh, people being deserved for con uh, deserving the, the, the financial rewards they receive for contributing to society in ways that are recognized by the market economy, right? It's a compelling, simple, moral idea that many people found uh, persuasive. And so, you know, I think that we as, as a group and uh, as a society right now need to be looking beyond just policy ideas to address specific problems and talking more broadly about the kind of moral world we'd like to inhabit and thinking about economics and policy in relation to a, a broader moral vision. That's really interesting. I mean, just um, you know, I feel like there are some people who could hear this conversation and just say, oh, these are just a bunch of lefties trying to get paid sick leave and, and other things like that pass. And I, I'm, what I'm taking from the conversation is that's not, not at all what you're saying, right? That you're saying, you know, we can, we can re, to use Margaret's language, we can remake the rules of how markets work to really put human flourishing at the center and the morality that all people, no matter what your political persuasion might be, care about. And that those are choices that we've made historically and that we can remake again. Um, so, Go ahead. Let me, let me just say, yeah, and I, I, I think that's right. And then the question is, what do we see flourishing as? And, what, <laughs> right? and that's a deep what and complicated is. question. And people have strong disagreements about that. And if, and if you want to persuade people of specific policies, you also need to persuade them of your vision of human flourishing. Right. Um, Anne-Marie. I was just going to mention that many of uh, the people who voted uh, for President Trump voted uh, on the grounds he talked about expanding social security. So this is not just a left-right uh, divide. Actually, I think that if we, we had a different political system and you could, you just, just based on what the majority of Americans want, you'd find a lot of support for a lot of these policies. All right, so I'm gonna, I, mean, and I wanna ask one last question before I take us to questions from the audience, but let me just remind the audience that um, if you wanna submit a question, I see that a lot have already come in during the conversation, um, but please do so just by using the dialog box off to the right or the bottom of your screen. Um, and I also just want to remind folks that um, our panelists are amazing and experts on many topics, but not on medical questions. So we can't answer <laughs> a specific medical questions about um, COVID-19. Um, so the, so the, the last question, um, Anne-Marie and Margaret, that um, maybe I'll um, pose um, to each of you is um, if you could make sort of one structural change coming out of COVID-19, what would be the thing that you would prioritize? And maybe that's an unfair question to ask, but maybe another way to think about it is what is, what's um, for all three of you actually, you know, what is top of mind in terms of the thing that we most urgently need to fix to reach for the kind of vision that you're describing, um, you know, in this the coming six to twelve months that we have in front of us. Well, I, I think it really has to do with the fact. One of the memes that's going around right now is we're all in it together, and the way I've always I've been thinking about it for some time is that we are interconnected and intertwined in terms of our destinies and fates. We have an expanded community of fate around a number of really key issues. And one of them that we haven't addressed, which is really part of what has changed since the 1980s, is our recognition of the existential threat of climate change. So even when COVID-19 is conquered, we still have on our hands of work. Uh, and really issue that Amber is raising about one of the underlying assumptions right now which I think a lot of the Trump supporters reject, is that we are just individuals um, intercon not connected to each other when in fact we're actually in communities that care about each other. So one concrete thing I think we can do is to really think about restructuring the way in which we um, deal with unemployment, we deal with the, the climate crisis. I love the idea of, of, of creating a new contemporary civilian conservation core, an idea that comes out of the 1930s, but that's focused on green jobs, on environmental protections, and on building the very needed infrastructure that, and rebuilding the infrastructure that we have, both not just roads and all of, and trains and planes, but education and schools and hospitals. I mean, we're seeing that our healthcare system is inadequate. But we have a lot of people who are going to be looking for work and a lot of people who were looking for work before that, um, where something like a civilian conservation corps would really bring our community to intertwine us 
enable us to forward, recognize that we're not in the individually, but together. Great. Um, Anne Marie? Uh, so I love those ideas and, and now is the perfect time finally to put national service in place, which many people have been trying for for a long time. But I'd say I, the thing I'd most want to do is to rewire both earning and learning in this country. Uh, what you are seeing is that the, the knowledge workers don't like being at home, don't like being locked down, but basically can continue working through screens. The folks who are either out of work or who are doing that essential work, stocking grocery shelves and delivery, they're the ones most at risk, risk from the automation that's coming. And we know it's coming. We've been writing about the future of work. They are the people that need reskilling uh, to be connected to a whole raft of new jobs. And this crisis is letting us see exactly where you need to focus for rewiring uh, the, essentially rewiring the labor market and connecting them uh, and giving them the skills they need. And similarly, kids, you know, kids of affluent parents don't just learn in school. They get all the stuff in the afternoon. They get sports, they get music, uh, they get art classes. Uh, the, all of those things they get, are provided by other institutions than schools, zoos and museums and theaters. We have a chance right now to think, how does a child learn? What are all the sources uh, of learning? And how do we connect those children, not just to their schools, but to their communities in different ways? Uh -huh. And Angus, before we turn to questions, do you have anything you wanna add? Um, I, can I, I'll add a big picture comment rather than as a historian, yeah. I have trouble thinking in six to 12 month uh, timeframes. Yeah. I mean, I, I just wanna say, I think that our crisis right now that what it, what it really reveals is the challenge which we're confronting across lots of areas from climate to corporations to epidemiology of a world that is global where governance is happening at the national level, right? Um, and uh, that's, it's particularly evident right now, but it's been, it's been showing signs for a long time that you can't, how can you regulate a multinational corporation through national bodies? It's very hard to do. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what I, I'm hoping is that this moment will provoke a new conversation about realistic global policy for an increasingly global world. There are plenty of good arguments against global governance and strong reservations about it. But I, I think that we need to confront the fact that if we're going to have a global world, we need to think about certain kinds of uh, regulatory policies uh, using a global framework. Yeah. Well, that's actually a great transition to questions. Um, the first question I thought maybe I would direct to you, Anne-Marie, but it builds directly on what you were just saying, um, Angus. Um, and the question comes to us from um, Javier in Barcelona, um, who, said, who basically asked, you know, are the ideas that we're talking about today scalable all over the world? Or is this something that's only relevant in the United States? And Anne-Marie, I thought I'd invite you into the conversation first, just thinking about your former role as Director of Policy at the State Department. I know that you've thought about this in the global context and would love to hear how you think, answer that question. Great question. First, the answer is uh, yes. There are many things that are happening in the United States that are scalable elsewhere and equally important uh, since the United States is behind the curve in many ways uh, right now, uh, we can learn from what other countries are doing. And when you look at uh, reimagining our moral economy or any of the subjects we've been talking about, uh, we are often borrowing uh, from other countries. We're borrowing and adapting. There's nothing that is sort of automatically replicable. Uh, but th this question of how you go beyond cross-fertilization and networks, which I've written a lot about, networks of businesses, of civic groups, of universities, um, that issue that Angus is raising is critical. What do we do when we really have to force people to do things, right? Where it's not just voluntary, where for our own sake, we have to stop emissions, as Margaret says, uh, for we have to be able to, to block a virus. And, you know, the World Health Organization isn't that. Uh, and there's nothing like that for the UN Environmental Program isn't that. That question of how we do get to more global governance that doesn't just replicate good things across countries, but is it more able to stop bad things? Maybe the, the central question of the next decade. Yeah, that's great. Um, I just have to say, I'm looking through the questions. There are so many great questions. So I'm gonna just keep us, keep us moving along. Um, 
Angus, I might um, turn this next question to you. It's from a gentleman named Eric who at says, um, can you talk a little bit about how the financialization of American business over the past 50 years um, has impacted the things that we're talking about? And is, is what we're describing a break from that process? And what's going to replace that financialization? <laughs> well, um, <that's, laughs> go, Angus. Go, Angus. That's a good question. I mean, it, it is. I mean, I guess I'll, 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 I'll just try to address that briefly by talking about the issue that um, I think it was Margaret that raised it earlier, which is that financialization is itself uh, reflective of an extraordinary transformation of the American economy, which is so evident at this moment. I think it had been happening in the background for a lot of people up until now, which is the relative shrinking of the agricultural and industrial sectors of the economy and the growth of the service sector for which financial services are a huge portion. Mm -hmm. And you know, a big issue associated with the growth of the service sector is that often positions in the service sector don't have, you know, white collar jobs are less conducive to unionization than blue collar jobs were a generation ago. Um, and um, they, they don't, you know, it, suddenly in this moment of crisis, many such positions can be seen as ephemeral. Uh, ephemeral. They can be uh, set aside while we focus on so-called core services, right? Something that would, really would have been unimaginable 50 or 100 years ago. And uh, so it's reflective of a kind of offloading of risk on the individual associated with a transition to a service economy and, a, and an economy centered increasingly on finance. And so, you know, I think that we need to think we're obviously not going to return to an agricultural or an industrial economy, and nor do we want to. But we need to think about how to reconceive our institutional structures uh, to be oriented around the kind of work that people in, in economies like the United States are now doing. Right. So reframing it to sort of meet the challenge of the 21st centuries um, as mm -hmm. we were talking about before. So, Margaret, I'm going to direct the next question to you, which is a question about the um, labor markets. And um, the questioner asks, you know, can you comment on how the two political parties in the U.S. view the labor market and its elasticity? And how does that affect the conversation that we're having? Um, and maybe you could describe for our general audience what elasticity of a labor market is <laughs> <laughs> in the broadest possible terms. <laughs> OK, so um, yeah, good question. Uh, so elasticity in the labor market really means uh, the extent to which there is uh, demand and supply for labor. Um, so is there a lot of labor out there that could be employed or is there not? Um, and this really gets back to the, and the, the two parties do tend to disagree on that, um, in part because of the failure of recognizing some of the things that Anne-Marie was talking about that they're not both parties see the same people in the labor market. Um, they don't they don't value the jobs in the same way. Uh, we, you know, you can see that in a variety. I don't want to get too. I don't want to get into deep partisan politics here, but it is going to be a problem going forward for policy if we don't understand that all jobs have value and that all deserve certain kinds of uh, pay and wages and uh, other things. So the way in which we've been defining the labor market has really been to segment it. And that's been true for a very long time. So there were the white collar workers who were in um, stable industries like the automobile industry mm -hmm. who were, who got that and that those are the men <laughs> that um, Anne-Marie was talking about. So that's become our model of what a worker is, is someone who's supporting a family and has a pension and a stable job. But a huge proportion of the population, even in the 60s and the 70s and 80s and 90s, was not in that kind of work. Right. And so we really have to recognize the full range of who's in the labor market. And the, uh, the final piece of this is we also have to recognize that there's a constant need for reskilling. The economy is changing and it's changing rapidly and in all kinds of dimensions. And the kind of educational system that we have and the kind of skill training that we have, particularly in this country, where we do not have a commitment to reskilling workers who lose their jobs, um, really has to change in response to, the, to what the labor market really looks like. Right, that's great. Um, so as we move into kind of last several questions that we can take probably, um, there's one from a woman named Heather who says, um, you know, that the, the ideas feel, as, as we're discussing them, feel really broad and intangible. So it's hard to imagine how we go from ideas, as Angus has talked to us about, to, to um, you know, changes in the lived experience that people have. And so 
the question that she asked is, you know, how can individuals actually do, how can, you know, the people who are our audience, what can they do to help make these changes happen? And um, I'd encourage, as, as you think about this, like I'd encourage you to think, I mean, obviously people can engage in things like voting and advocacy and things like that, but, you know, Anne-Marie, I certainly, uh, maybe I'll turn to you first, because in your New York Times piece, I feel like part of what you are describing is that there are other things that people can do, even as we respond to the pandemic in our communities that help begin to lay the foundation for a different way of, of being. So maybe I'll turn to you first, Anne-Marie. Absolutely. Uh, so a couple things come to mind because there, there are tremendous local initiatives across the country, everything from uh, people creating accounts that allow people to tip servers uh, and, and try to support uh, restaurant workers, others who have been, have been laid off, uh, to, to bigger efforts to, to keep those restaurants working as community kitchens uh, or to turn your uh, nonprofit staff that might usually work on climate change to help with food delivery uh, to people who uh, are now out of work. Or very concretely here in Princeton, uh, the schools are uh, becoming focal points or hubs for food delivery and service delivery because the schools are connected to the parents, right? And uh, in one community, they're actually sending school buses out not just with food, which is one, one thing you can even participate in, but with internet, right? So that, because again, the schools are connected to all the families and the families are connected to one another. So I, the thing I would urge people to do is start with your community and start by connecting people to people you're not usually connected to and trying to meet those needs, that will change your community. Uh, and longer term, it's going to change exactly what Margaret talks about. How do, who do we think we're connected to and do we care about what happens to them? Right, um, right before we started the call, we were talking about some of Margaret's work where she and her co-author, Don Alquist, talk about this idea of what's our community of fate. Um, and and Anne-Marie, I think that's sort of what you're referring to in that uh, last comment. So um, the next question comes from Liana, who says, um, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the questioner's names, um, the social inequality fissures are cracking open and being realized, but where does structural racism fit into this? Um, will we address racial inequality with class inequality? Um, and so maybe Anne-Marie or Margaret, I'll turn to one of you if, to see if you, I know that you all in the work that you've done already have thought about this, and if you wanna say a few words about that. I can just say very quickly, and Margaret can build on this, but when we talk about valuing care uh, and valuing so much of this work, uh, care work is done disproportionately by women of color uh, and often immigrant women. But even more broadly, when Margaret was talking about that ideal worker uh, that, we, that we premise our economy on, that was largely a white worker. There were African-American factory workers too, but if you look at uh, actually, the, the situation of other groups, African Americans, Latinx, other, other uh, minorities, very few of them fit this picture. So uh, I think what is essential is that it's cracked open as we reconceive who the we is and who, what the we needs. Uh, there have to be many, many more voices, the voices of, of the new America. Great. And I do think we have to think about these um, ideas like class in a whole, that's another one we have to really rethink. Mm -hmm. It's based on an industrial economy. It's based on a certain set of property rights, a certain set of ownership structures. And so we really do need to think about incorporation and inclusion, including racial inclusion in just a whole new framework. And a lot of what we've been talking about is really rebuilding what Eric Kleinberg would call our social infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that means incorporating everybody into it and finding ways in which they can cooperate and act together to, to imagine and then build a better world. So we're coming up against our time. I think I wanna ask two final questions. And what I'm noticing and looking at the questions is that a lot of them are asking um, you all to think more about how do we get there? <laughs> you know, So we've you painted the, this vision of this beautiful future and convinced everybody of the idea that what, what has been doesn't have to be. So how do we get there? And so I wanna um, lift up two particular questions. Um, one of which was, um, there are a couple of people who asked this and other questioners chimed in to 
say that it's an important one, which is how do you disrupt the clout of capital and wealth um, and, you know, that, that exists in our political system today? So it's kind of bringing in this question of some of the, um, you know, the moral economy that we want to build alongside the political challenges that exist to get there. And I, um, I don't know, Margaret, if you want to start with that or if um, someone else wants to chime in. Well, I think it's already being disrupted. Um, I think it was being disrupted before this crisis, this current crisis. Um, we saw all kinds of questions about uh, the people who have disproportionate, not only wealth, but also control over certain kinds of um, property rights, like our digital rights and other kinds of ways in which our world is really organized. So those questions were already being raised, which is part of what I think the opening was all about. And with this current crisis, um, we're really revealing who is in need, who's doing the work. And that too is extremely disruptive. Um, to be even more concrete, and this is a follow-up to several things that have been said, I think we really have to look at a lot of experiments that are going on all across our communities, all over the world, of trying to generate new ways of um, making economies and politics work. And there are a lot of those experiments going on. And so that's also disruptive, but it's also an incredible moment of experimentation from which we can learn. Right. Very concretely there, there's a, a a move that was already happening, but will speed up now to create new supply chains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Massive big global corporations that have supply chains all over the world, those supply chains are deeply vulnerable. Right. Uh, and 3D printing and, and sort of other ways of working more locally, uh, you're going to see new centers of economic power that have a more local supply chain. And again, there are experiments uh, there already. So maybe the final question, Angus, I'll start with you, um, which gets back to this idea that there are always a lot of ideas out there that are floating around. And um, Jake asks, you know, how do we organize, how do we essentially organize competition between these ideas, between a new imagined moral political economy and, you know, existing status quos or other ways of imagining the future? And so is our current system for political competition and public information adequate to meet that challenge? And so Angus, I'll invite you to jump in first and maybe then Anne-Marie and Margaret turn to you for uh, final word before we close. Well, it, it's, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, so I guess I started with Milton Friedman and I'll, re I'll return to him in my uh, uh, final comment here by saying that he, he emphasized that, you know, for him, the, the crucial vehicle for transformation was college students, right? Because he said, you know, these are generational stories. And you can certainly see this when you look at political opinion across a host of issues in an American context. There are generational divides in people's views about the kind of world they want to inhabit. Right? And so I'd argue, and this is a hard argument to make um, in the context of the present moment when it seems like many problems are so uh, pressing, but I'd argue that these are, these are long durée transformations and it's through processes of teaching and learning, uh, especially among people who are seeing the world anew as it is and not uh, merely proceeding with ideas that they developed a long time ago in a world that was a little bit different, um, that that's, that's the, the community that's most likely to, to shape a new moral political economy, right? And so we need to be as, uh, you know, as, as teachers, whether of, of younger people or college students or graduate students, or, or we need to be very credulous towards the idea that even if things seem intractable at the moment, even if the marketplace of ideas at the highest level seems immovable, it's very movable for people who are seeing the world anew and trying to figure everything out for the first time. And those are the people that five, 10, 15 years from now are gonna be making major policy decisions. And so if we, if we start there, we can see change unfold over time. Great, uh, Margaret? Well, I'm a political scientist, so I actually do think that uh, politics is one of the ways we're gonna change this. Um, and that there will be a competition and is a competition of ideas already going on in our political institutions. And we have to, this is the we again, we have to get much more engaged with this. So those who feel strongly about one set of experiments or one set of policies as opposed to another need to, I know this is an odd moment to call up for mobilization, um, but there are all kinds of ways to mobilize uh, mm -hmm. digitally and um, through letters and other things um, that really express, you know, the need for changes in certain areas. Exactly the precision of those changes will have to be worked out by compromise in politics like they always have been. And that's a healthy thing. 
as long as we have a system that is open to those various ideas and is willing to change over time as it learns. That's great. Anne-Marie? Uh, so I, I, I take both the historical and the political science approach, but I'm going to offer something uh, very concrete. Uh, so the single most important thing we could do right now is to reclaim our democracy. We have a country in which poll after poll shows that a majority of Americans want something, whether it's on climate change or gun safety or you name it, and we can't get there. And the single most effective change we could make and is being made in cities across the country and in the state of Maine is to move to ranked choice voting. So instead of just having two options and two parties, you could say, I want this person first and this person second and this person third. So I would tell everyone, go to the website uh, Fair Vote. Uh, and you can look at what's happening uh, in, in your state or in your city. This is, is we have changed our political system before uh, and we can again, college students, absolutely. Uh, it's time to essentially have a political system that has more voices and more choices. And all of us uh, can actually achieve that in our towns uh, and in our states and ultimately in our country. Well, certainly at the SNF Agora Institute, we believe that strengthening democracy strengthens our ability to solve our most complex um, social and political problems. And that's why we are working so hard to do the work that we do. So I just wanna close by thanking Anne-Marie, Margaret and Angus for being with us today. Um, thank you to our audience for watching and for sending in so many great questions. I hope that you'll join us again next Friday when we'll be discussing the global economic impact of COVID-19. Um, this week, we really focused on imagining the future. Next week, we'll have some economists who will join us and talk a lot about what are the impacts that we're seeing around the world today. Our guests will be Matt Kahn, who is a professor of economics at Johns Hopkins University and director of the 21 Century Cities Initiative, and Kathleen Day, a lecturer at the Carey School of Business and the author of a book about the history of major financial crises. And next week, I won't be here. Matt Kahn will be your moderator next week. So I look forward to seeing you all in future weeks. And finally, I also want to mention that a recording of today's webcast will be available on our website, which is snfagora.jhu.edu. And we hope to see you all again next week. Thank you. Thank you.